Finabbers. My name is Jesse Meekham, and this is podcast number 42 for You Need a Budget, where we teach you four rules to help you stop living paycheck to paycheck, get out of debt, and save more money. Today, I am pleased to bring you an interview I did with Dan Miller, best-selling author of 48 Days to the Work You Love, and also a great, just inspiring speaker. And we talk about career, passion, goal setting, and uh, I don't want to take up much more of your time. Let's get right to my interview with Dan. I'm uh, on the line with Dan Miller. He's the author of 48 Days to the Work You Love and No More Mondays, and then a new book that is coming out August 22nd called Wisdom Meets Passion. So hello, Dan. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, Jesse. Absolutely. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, I want to really dive right in. I've got um, a lot of people on the line that are nerds. They're budgeting nerds. They love... uh, just crunching numbers, and they love telling their money what to do. But we run into a situation, a lot of people do, where they're really managing their finance as well, and they're feeling happy with where they're spending their money, but they aren't feeling happy with where they spend the bulk of their day, which is earning that money. And um, that's something that I immediately thought of you. I originally heard of you years ago. I think you were on the Dave Ramsey show at the time. And um, so I, I found you there, and I've just kind of followed you along and read your book uh, years ago and helped me kind of get uh, confidence to make the jump and, you know, run my own show. So um, we'll just kind of take it from there. And um, I know a lot of people, they, they want to earn more money. They recognize when they're looking at their budget that that's what they need. So I wanted to ask you first, if there was one particular trait or habit that you can attribute someone's success to when they say, I'm going to you know, I want to be successful working for someone. I want to sell. I want to start my own thing. Is there one overarching trait that you see repeated? Well, there really is, and it may sound simple, but it's simply taking action. A lot of people talk about what they want to do. They have dreams, wishes, and hopes, but that's all they ever are. But it's a person who takes action that's going to change their family future. Now, when you talked about in your opening, Jesse, about people who are managing their budgets well, but they spend their days doing things they aren't really excited about, there's really a connection there. You've got a circular kind of conversation going on because when people are doing something that they really aren't thrilled about, it doesn't connect with their strongest talents. You know, there's a sense of joy being in the zone, any way you want to frame it, what makes their heart sing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the funny thing is people often think, whether well, they're being responsible, practical, utilitarian by doing something that they know how to do well and it produces income for their family, so they just bite the bullet and do that even though they don't enjoy it. The assumption is that if I did something I really enjoyed, then my income would go down. And mm-hmm. I never have been able to understand why people would think that because experience hopefully should teach all of us it's a whole lot easier to make money doing something we really love and enjoy than doing something where we just think we have to do it. It just we, we don't release our best. And if we really can engage the, what really does give us a sense of joy, then money shows up in unexpected ways. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the people who have done a good job of managing their finances, I mean, those are great people for me to work with. I love to work with people who have already been through some kind of program to get their finances in order because I know they have already exercised the discipline of setting goals, carrying mm-hmm. through, taking action, man, those people are great candidates to say, okay, now let's look at your career, the career part of your life. Yeah, that's fantastic. I was uh, listening to something that's no, uh, you know, people in the success industry, motivational industry. I I was listening to an Earl Nightingale bit about The Strangest Secret for the first time, and I'd heard a lot about it, but I listened to it two days ago. Oh, and it's like, this, you really? it's like his blast to the past. I love his voice, just the audio alone, just his voice oh. was fantastic. So... I'm sitting here listening to that, and there's a part where you need to determine what you want. You know, where you, I mean, that's the whole thing is, and you just mentioned taking action. I, I uh, sometimes I sit here, and I actually have a note card in front of me that not related to the interview, but it says at the top on the red line, it says what I want, and then colon, and then it's completely blank. And I've been staring at that card for a few days, trying to realize. figure out exactly what I want. I've, I reached, and this probably shouldn't turn into a self-help session, although it might, but I, uh, I've reached this level where I'm comfortable and where my family's comfortable and we've got a great team assembled and the, the business is moving forward. And I, 
I've been so motivated by fear of failure in the past or just being scrappy, you know, or paying off my house or something like that, some kind of external goal that now I sit here and I'm, I'm really struggling with it. And I wonder if there aren't others that, I don't know if you have some key questions or something that I could ask myself that everyone listening could ask themselves to find that higher calling, that higher purpose, and then be able to say, okay, that's what I want. That's what brings me joy. And if you could walk us through something like that. Wow. That's really interesting because I, I'm one of those, you know, I have so many things that I want to accomplish and so many things in that list. And it does intrigue me when somebody says, you know, I've kind of hit what I set out as goals. Here's, here's what I do. At the beginning of the year, of course, before that, I mean, I always had my goals set out very clearly for the coming year by November 15th of mm -hmm. the preceding year. So in that time, I'm identifying all the things that I want to accomplish in multiple areas of life, not just career and finances, but other areas like physical, spiritual, family, mm -hmm. social, and so on. But here's how I set my goals. I set my goals so that I have about a 50-50 chance of hitting them. Okay. If I ever really hit my goals, I would think, oh, my gosh, what did I miss? I mean, it's, it's like a high jumper. we get got the Olympics going on right now. It's like yeah. a high jumper jumping the bar. If he always clears the bar, we don't really have a good measurement of how good he is. I feel that way with myself. I want to set the bar high enough. There's more than a likely, uh, likely chance that I'm going to trip the bar. Mm -hmm. But at least then I know I've stretched as far as I can go. So I'm always doing things, even that may seem you know, pretty astronomical, and certainly I'm sure to other people is unrealistic. But I share my goals openly with anybody, recognizing, yeah, I am not going to hit them all. There's always things that I'm reaching for. And last year I had as a goal to create a new product every month. Now wow. that's pretty aggressive, but I just set that as part of my, my goal, a new product, whether it's an audio product or a manifesto, whatever I happen to, you know, whatever form it took, but a new product. Well, I did that for 10 months, and then in November negotiated a, a contract with my publisher for a manuscript that they wanted February 1st. So I switched gears to put all my efforts in the manuscript, then having you know less than 90 days to complete that and get it to them. So when you look at that, I didn't hit my goal of 12 new products. Mm -hmm. I only did 10. But when you frame it as such, you don't run into a whole lot of other people out there that created 10 new products in a given year. Yeah. So, so even though I theoretically failed, I still had a level of accomplishment you know, that separates me from most of the pack. And again, I don't say that in a bragging way, but I, that's just how, how I set goals so that I know they're really going to stretch me. But I've always got other things out there that I want to accomplish. So if you reach a point where you think, man, you know, I'm really not sure what's next. Yeah, do like you do. Put a card out there. What do I want? But don't let a whole lot of time going by without putting something yeah. in there yeah. to keep your efforts focused. Yeah, it's interesting. Some goals come easily to me, like I, you know, fitness goals, goals with my kids. You know, where I, I think, well, yeah, this is the obvious next step. But with uh, with career, with business, I've started thinking, oh, what is the, you know, what do I personally want to, uh, you know, to accomplish? And maybe it's just a matter of kind of assessing what I'm naturally going for, and then clearly delineating, okay, this is what I want, instead of just kind of letting everything whipsaw me around back and forth. So. I certainly couldn't be the only person that's dealing with that, where you have more external factors kind of telling you what you should be working on than what you probably really want to focus on. So um, there are people that they're, I mean, I'm biased toward the entrepreneur because I've seen what, it, what it's done for me and uh, what it's done for my family and just the flexibility that, it, that I enjoy. And by that, I mean flexibility by, but also you never, you know, you're never done with your job at any moment. Something bad can happen. I'm the one that has to answer for it. So it's, there's also, there's a lot of times the pipe dream of the entrepreneur, like, Oh, you're, you set your own schedule and that schedule is that you work all the time, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but there, there are people that they don't see themselves as entrepreneurs that, but they're remarkably talented. Um, is there any advice you could give to someone, you know, listening there that's saying, I, I want to do this, but they're, they're afraid. They're maybe afraid to try, um, and fail, or they just don't see themselves as an entrepreneur? When we talk about entrepreneur, most people immediately 
conjure up these images, you know, Donald Trump, Oprah, yeah. Ted Turner, you know, people are just, you know, radically out there, just crazy wild people with no constraints. It's really not an either or. The continuum between being an employee and being an entrepreneur is a long continuum and has a whole lot of stopping points on there. So somebody could say, well, I've been a really good bookkeeper, a graphic designer for this company, but I know I'm vulnerable here. Instead of being so vulnerable, I'm going to find five companies that are not large enough to use me full time, but could use me one day a week. That'd be a very soft transition in work model. Still mm -hmm. doing the same work, still being paid by companies for what it is that you do well, but you've increased your margin, in my estimation, increased your security by then having five customers rather than one. So when we continue down that spectrum, then you could be you know, a consultant, you could be a freelancer, all those terms we're hearing. We're not really entrepreneurs, but somebody who understands what it is they do well, and that's what they focus on. You know, we could say, well, you want to do something on your own, but you don't really want to have to start something from scratch. Well, I kind of just defined what franchising is as the model. Here's a proven prototype. You can do this. We're going to help you. And, of course, their mantra in franchising is you're in business for yourself but not by yourself. Mm -hmm. So then we, But we continue coming over. Well, then we have, you know, the kid who goes to Home Depot this afternoon and spends 500 bucks to buy a lawnmower, and he's in the lawnmowing business. Yeah. So, so there's a whole lot of different stopping points on that, and there's not one right place for everyone to be. I had a lunch with a young gentleman this week. He just turned 40. He's been with an organization for a long time. This happens to be a ministry organization where he has to raise his own support, but he's kind of outgrown his audience, and he says, man, I need to get out of this and go do something else and generate more income for my family. And he said, now, Dan, I know you're going to tell me, you know, I need to go out here and just start something on my own. There's all these opportunities. I need to be an entrepreneur. And I said, no, I don't think that's fitting for you. He says, what do you mean? I said, you have great relationship-oriented customer service selling skills. I said, that is the most transferable skill you could possibly have and the most valuable skill you could possibly have. There are companies out here by the hundreds who are waiting for somebody like you to come along and align yourself with them. And in doing so, you stay focused on what it is you do well. It's still going to give you a lot of freedom, open income potential, but you don't have to take care of all the business and the administrative things. I said, I don't see you as a true entrepreneur. I see you as somebody who could use your selling skills Stay focused on that and do it really in an excellent way. Mm -hmm. So if somebody cringes at the idea of being an entrepreneur, that's fine. But then just be willing to be realistic about what does that mean. Yeah. I, mean, I love being an entrepreneur because it does remove all those constraints. But I don't look for somebody to tell me when to show up, you know, when to take a break. You know, I don't look for two weeks vacation. You know, I, I intend to create all those things. Yeah, I love the, the thrill and the challenge of doing that, but it's not something that I recommend for everybody by any means. And so on this on this continuum, you you have the the person that uh, on the other extreme that does look for the two weeks, that does look for uh, someone to tell them when to take breaks, and then on the other end you have just person who you say, gosh, you can't even remember to pay your bills. They're just so wild flying and just kind of take risks that I would say, or this is crazy, you know. But it's just one other way to operate and uh and then in between there you got the kid that buys his own lawnmower he's an entrepreneur you have the bookkeeper mm -hmm. that finds a few more clients instead of just working for one and suddenly they're an entrepreneur i like that but, is there um yeah, now, oh, go ahead I, I think it's also helpful to point out jesse that we're talking about real different models here i mean we can talk about somebody who is an employee. That's the most common kind of work model. And then we talk about somebody who's self-employed. But then we also talk about having a business or being an investor. So mm -hmm. there's really kind of four quadrants we can look at. A lot of people move from being an employee, so the bookkeeper just has more, more clients. They don't really have a business in the way that we would want to define it. Yeah. They have created a job for themselves, and that's fine. They're self-employed. But a business implies that money continues to come in, even if you're sitting on the beach with your kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a critical difference. And a lot of people kind of deceive themselves. They think they have a business when all they've done is just moved into self-employment. 
again, no right or wrong, good or bad about this, but be realistic about that because sometimes those people then are, are discouraged because there's no real dramatic increase in their income. There's no leveraging of their intellectual expertise. Mm -hmm. They still find themselves just working a lot of hours and barely getting by. Yeah, if I'm, I'm discovering that myself just in my own business. As, as uh, the business grows, I'm finding out that I really need to become more skilled in managing the system and the team and less skilled in, in the implementation. And uh, it's a transition that is, is, has proven to be difficult for me where suddenly I say, well, wait, I have to make sure someone is doing this correctly and make sure that our expectations are being met instead of just me going and doing that myself, which I always found to be the easiest. You know? mm -hmm. So it's a new challenge. And, uh, and it's just, yeah, all along that continuum where uh, you're answering to someone else specifically and then you're answering to multiple people and then pretty soon you're managing someone else and having them answer on your behalf, which is completely scary for me. And then, you know, going from there until you have someone that's managing some other people and, and it just, the whole thing freaks me out. So, Well, it, it, the challenge for a lot of us as entrepreneurs is to learn how to delegate. And the thing that cripples most people who do try to start their own business is that they try to do everything. So all of a sudden they start their own business, but now what they truly enjoy doing, they're spending 10% of their time doing that, 90% running the business. That's not a good thing to do. I mean, Michael Gerber talked about that on EMET. Mm -hmm. We end up working in our business rather than on it. Right. If you really are going to have a business, there ought to be times when you can sit back, take a deep breath, plan where you're going to be three years from now, delegate things. I mean, I tell people in a business, even a little business like what we have, there are probably 20, 25 different things that need to be done. Well, guess what? I probably do two or three of those things pretty well. That's where I want to spend my time. I don't want to spend my time doing the things where I don't do them well anyway. I just find people to come alongside whose skills supersede my own in those areas, let them do what they enjoy, so I can spend 95% of my time just in my tiny sweet spots. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic advice. So when we when people talk about, uh, or when you mentioned, you know, pursuing, uh, pursuing your passion, determining your calling and purpose, what, um, what can someone... I don't know, are there any like kind of starter questions where you could say, okay, work through these questions, you know, this isn't something you just spew out on a piece of paper in five minutes, obviously, but is there any way you could get someone started along that path to find their purpose? They're not satisfied where they're working or what they're doing. Yes. Uh, is any, any guidance you can give there? Sure, absolutely. That's a real common question and a good question. The thing that surprises people sometimes is that I tell them 85% of the process of having the confidence of proper direction or finding your calling and purpose comes from looking inward first. We too quickly get the cart before the horse. Well, gee, we know there's a lot of opportunities in computer science or IT, you know, so let's jump on the bandwagon. Or we know they're hiring down the street at this company, this manufacturing plant, you know, I'll go do that. No, those are Band-Aid solutions. Hmm. Looking inward first to really identify what are my unique skills and abilities? How has God equipped me things that I know I do well continuously? What are my personality tendencies? How do, how do I relate to other people? What kind of environments do I function well in? How do I manage, sell, persuade? And then, so we've got skills and abilities, personality tendencies, and then the third area is what I call values, dreams, and passions. What are those things that just keep reoccurring? And sometimes I compare it to like whack-a-mole, the old county fair, you know, you knock mm -hmm. it down and pops up. What is it that keeps popping up in your life? Oh, it's when I'm working with the elderly. Oh, it's when I'm working with ideas and not people at all. We want to start to look for recurring themes, and in doing so, those things come together. Those are the essence, then, of what we would have in a personal mission statement and really help to develop what our purpose and calling is, where we can, with confidence, and this is not some magical, mystical kind of thing. We go sit on a hillside, wait for a bolt of lightning. <laughs> no, it's by looking at what God has already told us, but by being realistic in looking at those things, we can identify, this is what I'm positioned and prepared to do. Thus, that is my purpose and calling. That's fantastic. Well, I think, I think we should end on that because that is something that people can walk away with and take action on immediately, myself included. Um, just yeah. being able to uh, work through that and... Um, you know, you, you do find, I like how you said you find kind of glimpses of it, reoccurring themes. And yeah. that's something that, 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 that little bit right there will help me as I look at this note card 
trying to think where I should spend my time in the business. I love the business, but I, I recognize mm -hmm. I only love about 15% eh, of it. So, ah. um, this is, this is good. So everyone did get to help hear a little bit of a self-help session for today's podcast, but that was just, that was my own selfish me that did that, I guess. So this was good. <laughs> Dan, well, I, I'm delighted there's something that fits that challenge yeah, that, you as well. That's, that's great, great stuff. Well, and that's, that's the way we, we as guys like you and me, that's the way we learn. We learn best by teaching the things we need to know and develop ourselves. Isn't that the truth? So your your website is 48days.com, is that correct? That's correct. Four, so the number 48days.com. The I, I need to revisit your book. I noticed the 48 days one that you it was revised and updated. When I read it years ago, I don't I don't think that was the case. So I might have to relook at that and just refresh uh, on my own mission. But I, I want to really just... Thank you for being on the show and uh, for sharing your your great insights on this. It was really, really good stuff, and I'm sure that it's helped a lot of listeners out there, so I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity and hope that we really did uh, give your listeners some hope and encouragement and inspiration just to take a, take a fresh look at where they are to more fully develop the wisdom and passion that each of them have. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Dan. You have a great rest of the week, and, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk to you again. Okay. Thanks. All right. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, my interview with Dan Miller. You can visit his website at 48days.com. That's 48days.com. He's got a lot of great uh, free information there and then some uh, just books that, uh, that I would recommend, especially the, the original that I uh, read you know, quite a while ago, 48 Days of the Work You Love. And it's got some great exercises in there to help unlock your passion Get you focused on uh, making more money, doing something you love more. And that is a great place to be. Uh, until next time, follow YNAB's four rules and you will win financially. You have not budgeted like this. 